the floor to ask questions if you want, because we have uh, experienced recently in Taiwan very important things with very uh, well, uh, situations quite difficult to interpret. So there is uh, much room for debate. If you have any questions or any comment to make or to ask uh, regarding ethnicity, the referendum, elections, and so on, I would be more than willing to uh, discuss it with you. I've been in Taiwan quite often recently, approximately every three weeks in the last month. So I, I have a um, strong feeling and a lot of experience about what happened. Uh, I don't mean that I understand, but at least I have some personal impressions that I would like to share with you if you're interested. So, yeah, Jonathan said that I published this book recently. So. I wanted to share it with you. I brought a few copies to offer you, and I forgot them in San Francisco. It's there, but this might be because of the time difference, the jet lag. But here is one copy because one person here took it from Taiwan. And this book uh, is a political essay uh, that I wrote in Chinese in the last uh, last fall, last year, and uh, which was published in January in Taiwan. And uh, this public, this book has attracted quite a large attention in Taiwan because it was written on a topic that nobody wrote on before. Uh, I, I mean the mainlander uh, identity crisis in Taiwan, which is a very uh, complex, emotional, and sensitive issue. And uh, if you don't mind, I can start with this issue because it will maybe help us to understand better the uh, current political situation in Taiwan and why there is such a uh, strong debate about uh, national identity issue in Taiwan. So this book, the subtitle is Taiwan It means Taiwan's mainlanders and the uh, national identity <laughs> for those who, I suppose everyone of you speak Chinese. Oh, well, yeah. So I don't need to translate, that's what you mean, right? <laughs> I need to translate or I don't need to translate? <laughs> so, I have a view. I have a view to bet someone there in Jamka. Okay, okay. So, let's be in English. So, um, mainlanders in Taiwan are a minority called today an ethnic group, though some of them deny uh, being part of an ethnic group, saying that they only belong to the Han race and that there is no such uh, mainlander or Taiwanese ethnic groups in Taiwan. But usually that kind of discourse is held in, by uh, pro-unification, well, more conservative persons in Taiwan. Usually today, Taiwanese scholars uh, separate Taiwan's situation into what we say, so four big ethnic groups, the mainlanders, the Holo, the Taiwanese, uh, the original Taiwanese, the Yuan uh, Zhumi, the Aborigines, and the Kajia, uh, the Haga. And uh, the situation of the mainlander is very interesting because as you know, after the Second World War, Taiwan became part of, the, uh, of China again, precisely the Republic of China. And a few years after, well, you know all the, you all know the story. <coughs> I'm, I'm going to be brief. Uh, <coughs> the uh, central Chinese government uh, left the mainland to go to Taiwan and brought with him uh, approximately 1,000, uh, 1 million mainlanders. Often in books we find 2 million mainlanders. In fact, this is propaganda to be, uh, seriously speaking, there is only 1 million mainlanders. Uh, but it's still a lot of uh, big population because at that time Taiwan's population was only 5 million. So 5 plus 1 is 6, and it's oh, uh, six, um, one, um, 6 out of 1. No, 1 out of 1 anyway. <laughs> <laughs> if I say in Chinese, it will be easier for me, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, uh, anyway, you can how to say that. One out of six. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and a few years after, you know,
know what happened. So when the main entrance arrived in Taiwan, for historical and political reasons, a dictatorship was uh, was uh, uh, organized by Jiang Jiexi in Taiwan because he lost the civil war in mainland. They wanted to recover mainland. And the fact that uh, Taiwan was the last uh, remaining free province of the Republic of China with already a different identity exacerbated by the uh, so-called uh, uh, February 28th incident made it necessary for Jiang Chang, Jiexi Chang to control Taiwan's polity as much as he could because if Taiwan was to declare its independence at that time, then the Republic of China would instantly vanish. So it was essential for him. And that's one of the biggest reasons explaining why he, uh, he uh, organized the dictatorship regime in Taiwan, uh, which is different from the totalitarianism, uh, totalitarian <coughs> regime, but still it was a strong dictatorship. So um, during that period, all mainly, uh, may, may, uh, the, mo the biggest part, of the, uh, of the uh, administrative jobs and uh, intellectual professions and military positions were held by the so-called mainlanders coming from mainland. And uh, of course, I, I simplify very much because it's a long story. I wrote my PhD on it and I wrote 800 pages. So <laughs> this is to tell you that I could talk in much more detail. I try to, take, to make things uh, simple. And so during 50 years, many leaders in Taiwan had the power. Uh, but not only the power in terms of administrative power, military power, and so on. They had also the power in, ten, in terms of, of thought and ideology on what uh, Taiwan's identity is and what should be the future for Taiwan. <laughs> and uh, during those 50 years when the KMT was in power, uh, the Taiwanese were not allowed to express a different voice in terms of identity. Uh, I remember that uh, until very recently, in the 80s, uh, one of the recent electoral presidential candidates in Taiwan, uh, namely Song Chu Yu, uh, was responsible for implementing the policy of forbidding, forbidding Taiwanese uh, to speak, uh, well, to, to to, well, to control the, the time on each TV program so uh, Taiwanese language could be used. Uh, things have changed uh, and uh, recently he changed his position too. So during those 50 years, Taiwanese were denied the possibility to express their own identity in a very severe way. Uh, why is it interesting to study Taiwan, the mainlanders identity crisis? Is that because during the 90s, uh, big changes started to happen, right? Li Danghui was elected as KMT chairman and president after the uh, death of Jiang Jingguo. And long, uh, um, how to say, uh, very far-reaching reforms. Uh, he started to implement far-reaching reforms in terms of identity. And little by little, the mainlanders lost, gradually lost their power within the administrative and political circles. But even most importantly, we started to reform some political myths and ideologies and official discourses regarding Taiwan's identity and the relations across the strait, which made mainlanders more and more ill at ease. Because not only they were losing power, but they were also losing an idea I, I would even dare to say an illusion, but this is not very subjective, not very objective. An illusion that they <coughs> used to comfort themselves uh, because they, are bas they were basically refugees from mainland. They had lost their land, they had lost their families, and most of them came in Taiwan in a tragic situation. And their psychology was marked by a, that tragedy, which was very difficult for them to overcome, and we should be honest and, and recognize that it's, it's, it's indeed very hard to overcome. So in the 90s, all this started to disappear. And what was for them a sacred objective, the unification with mainland, whatever the, uh, the way to unify with mainland, started, uh, little by little, started to vanish and to be put to a, um, to a longer term, very far away, without any precise time frame. So uh, then started the uh, identity crisis, and a very, very strong identity crisis. And so I studied them because um, mainlanders in Taiwan still retained a lot of power in the military circles, administrative circles, even, even today. Huh? 
and at each level of the administration. And most important, their ideology of the Chinese-ness of Taiwan and Taiwan's Chinese identity is still very pervasive. Uh, I'm not commenting on it, it is it legitimate or not true or, or wrong, but I just made the, 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 the simple remark that this ideology is very is still pervasive and present in many, many uh, areas of Taiwan society, like in the media. And so it's interesting because this um, population has <coughs> I'm sorry, has become a politically sensitive, politically sensitive um, population. It's a minority, but it still keeps a, lot, um, a strong power. And its ideology uh, is directly opposing another ideology which is mainstream today in Taiwan. So again, I'm not saying which one is legitimate, which one is illegitimate. I'm just saying that there is uh, an opposition which is very clear in Taiwan now, not between Wai Shan and Ban Shan mainlanders and Taiwanese, not between Tongdu and Haidu, uh, the Tongyi and Haidu, the unification and independence, not at all. The true dividing line is between Zhongbo Yi Shi and Taiwan Yi Shi, Chinese consciousness and Taiwanese consciousness. Because when you draw a line between mainlanders and Taiwanese, then you have the ethnic criterion, right? When you draw a line between Tongdu and Taidu, it's difficult to measure because uh, polls in Taiwan are not done in a very satisfactory fashion. But when it comes to Zhongguo uh, Yishi and Taiwan Yishi, Chinese consciousness and Taiwanese consciousness, you have people of different ethnic origin on both sides. You have Taiwanese people who have a strong Chinese consciousness, and you have a few mainlanders who have a strong Taiwanese identity. So it shows that the dividing line is not anymore between Taiwanese and mainlanders, not between unification and independence. The true dividing line nowadays in Taiwan is between Chinese identity and Taiwanese identity. And what is interesting is that among Taiwanese population, whether Holo or Hakka, you have many people with a strong Taiwan consciousness, and many people who are in favor of Taiwan unification with mainland, and with a strong Chinese consciousness. But the reverse is not necessarily true. You have many mainlanders who are most, most of them with a strong Chinese consciousness, though it's not 100% of them. So it's very interesting because this minority which retains a strong power has an ideology that directly contradicts the new road that Taiwan, the new way, the new path that Taiwan is following now regarding national identity and the relations across Taiwan Straits. <coughs> Namely, or maybe, well, to say it more clearly, they will tend to vote for candidates who uh, promote unification and attack uh, the localization as being a way to Chu Zhongguohua to take rid of the Chinese culture in Taiwan. Uh, I think this is very interesting to know that over 80% of the mainlanders vote for mainlander candidates. And the opposite is not true, because if it was true, if, mainland, if Taiwanese people would vote, were voting for Taiwanese candidates uh, in such a big uh, proportion, then there would be no question of any more, any mainlander being elected in Taiwan anymore because they are a minority. So it's interesting to see that this population in Taiwan is, is a, per, um, a contradiction factor, a, a factor that contradicts the current policy in Taiwan. So again, I'm not saying I'm in favor or not. I just made this remark. It's very interesting to see that they are really that um, a factor. So in that book, I, I, I'm, I, I tried to, to answer the question, are they Taiwanized or not? Because most people in Taiwan would say, oh, mainlanders, they are all pro-unification, and some people, some people who are very extreme would even say, mainlanders are ready, ready to sell Taiwan to China. And in fact, when you, re when you look at things in a scientific way, not at all. It's a very interesting thing to see that mainlanders do identify to Taiwan in each generation first one, which, came, which comes from mainland, the second and third one born in Taiwan. 
and all of them do identify to Taiwan. In 97, I distributed in Taiwan a um, questionnaire with 178 questions, a very big, very thick questionnaire, asking them questions about the, um, uh, their identification to Taiwan, several questions to use different angles to measure it. And it was very clear. I give you one example about unification because it's the most uh, relevant, the most interesting issue. I asked them, do you support uh, unification or not? Just give me one second. I'm going to look for the exact figure. If I speak without the microphone, will you hear? OK, so I just need to talk. And that's, that would be better. So I ask the question in two ways, because there is a theoretical way to approach unification, and there is a more um, day -to -day, in day-to-day -day life. So the first question, I first read in Chinese, because the questionnaire was in Chinese, and I translate. So the first question was, 你是否认为 中华民国政府应当绝对坚持两岸统一的政策? Which means, do you, uh, do you support the idea that the ROC uh, government must absolutely pursue the unification, the, object, uh, the objective of unification. Can you compromise with this or not? Do you think that the government can compromise or not? And I would expect that maybe over 80% of the mainlanders would say no. Uh, yeah, uh, no, they can't compromise with it. The first surprise was that in average, only 50% of the mainlanders said no, this could not be compromised with. And then when you do a, an analysis by um, Shida, generation, then you see that the older generation, 78%, a lot. The, the second generation, 51%, the third generation, 34 Which means that the mainlander who came from mainland and who were supposed to have a very uh, conservative point of view about Taiwan's uh, future and so on, in fact, it's not that clear. And the second way, because this question is in terms of what is your position in, prin in terms of principle, on the principle. So I asked another question because I think that it's not, net, it's not satisfactory in Taiwan. We always ask that kind of question, but it does not make justice to the day-to-day -day identification schemes. So I asked another question. I asked the mainlanders to, to rank by priority what should the ROC government attain in terms of priorities? So I gave them different priorities like fighting against corruption, uh, helping the, the economy to recover, increasing Taiwan's visibility on the world stage, pursuing unification, and doing Huanba, uh, environmental protection. And what is surprising is that the number of mainlanders uh, who chose pursuing unification as the first priority of all, there is only 5%. It means that even mainlanders supposed to be so conservative consider that unification is a priority. But among the priorities I gave them, like what I said, huh? it's the last of them. So this shows very clearly that mainlanders in Taiwan are Taiwanized. So now the question is why? Do they vote for pro-unification candidates? And then, why do so many Taiwanese in Taiwan voted for Song Chu and Lian Jia in this election? And the reason might be that um, what I show here is that they have a pluralistic form of identification. In their identification scheme, you have Taiwan and China, the two parts. It's a uh, different... Um, uh, how to say, proportions, depending on the reasons. And they have this plurality. But when it comes to voting to a, to a vote, they have to make a choice. Because when you vote, you have to make a choice. You, you give one vote to one candidate, you cannot choose Abien, Abien and, and Lian Zhang at the same time. So you have to make a choice. And when you make a choice, then the question is, since they have two choices, why do they choose uh, Lian Zhang and not Abien? And the, the reason is very complex to explain. It's a question of political socialization and political debate. Political socialization is very clear. They have been educated for 50 years in the idea that they are Chinese only. 
like Lian Zhan said a few years ago when he was in, uh, in America, I am purely 100% Chinese. He does not say the same thing today. Is it for electoral reasons or because he himself evolved? I think the two reasons might, might, might be true. <coughs> And so there is poly the, the, the uh, remaining influence of political socialization. Then you have another reason, is the politicization of the debate. Just figure out that the mainlander uh, politicians in Taiwan need both to find, to find jobs and salaries, because their job is to be politicians, so if they're not elected like every politician, they're out, they have no job, and so on. And also they want to preserve this objective that is fundamental to them, unification. So they tend to um, obliterate in Taiwanese population, among, among which are the mainlanders, to obliterate the natural tendency to identify to Taiwan. If, if I'm not clear, I would like, uh, maybe I should uh, formulate things in a different way. Um, they tend to, to prevent Taiwan's mainlanders to identify naturally to Taiwan. In the day-to-day -day life, Taiwan's mainlanders do identify to Taiwan, but in electoral uh, campaigns, the mainlander candidates try to politicize the issue, and the other side tries to do the same, probably the same. But um, there is a trend, a natural trend in Taiwan, which is called Bentuhua, nat nativization, uh, and it's hard to fight against that. So, since the mainlander politicians always try to contradict this, they are in a, kind, in a very ambiguous situation, a kind of paradox, a historical paradox, is that they are themselves uh, part of Taiwan, identifying to Taiwan, but when they have to uh, be elected, when they have an electoral discourse, they try to be more, <coughs> to emphasize more Chinese consciousness and not Taiwanese consciousness. Why? Because the opposite side is emphasizing so strongly the Taiwanese consciousness that you have to make a difference. You have to draw a line. Otherwise, you won't be different. And if you're not different, how are you going to be elected? That's a mere, a very simple electoral logic. So that is why today, though everyone in Taiwan is identifying to Taiwan, even the most pro-unification people in Taiwan, they cannot deny that they identify to Taiwan, except maybe a few very, uh, very a few extremists who openly say, Chinese communists can attack us, I welcome them. Among, a f except a few of them, most people in Taiwan do identify to Taiwan. And that why, that's, that's why there is this paradox between this, that's why in, though there is this trend, this deep trend towards nativization and Bantuwa in Taiwan, there are still so many people now emphasizing Chinese consciousness, like we, what we saw in the um, in the election, just because there is this remaining influence of socialization, the remaining importance of what of mainlanders, and the um, and the uh, necessity to differentiate yourself with the current party in power. So that's why it's still a very big debate, and it's bigger and bigger in time. And that has a lot of political consequences, such as the referendum. The referendum issue was very interesting because on the principle of theory of democracy, democracy theory, one cannot oppose a referendum because it's a direct uh, a tool of direct democracy which naturally completes a, uh, an indirect or representative democracy. In French constitution, our third article states very clearly the national sovereignty lays in the people which exert it by its representant and, uh, and the referendum. So basically, nobody can oppose it. The problem is that everyone knew in Taiwan that it was also a way to give an occasion to Taiwanese people to express themselves uh, on a very big issue, relations across the Strait. 
That's why from the very beginning, proponents of Chinese consciousness in Taiwan opposed the referendum. And because of this historical ambiguity in which they are today, it was very hard for them to fight against the referendum. So they, did not, they could not fight against the principle of referendum. So finally, the KMT did vote for it. But they beat around the bush. They find many, many different reasons to attack it from, from the different sides, from the sides, but not frankly. So they have made a lot of amendments in the law to reduce its power and avoid the referendum, referendum to be, in the future, a tool by pro-independence parties to go even further into the exploration of the status quo. So through the referendum, I can switch from the first topic I was <coughs> discussing this afternoon, the mainlanders, and the second one, which is the a status quo in the Taiwan Strait. So I will be very brief on that second topic because I, I hope we can leave some time to the, uh, for you. And I think that half of the time is passed already. So um, uh, for the referendum, many people abroad condemned it, such as the president of my country, <coughs> Jack Chirac, who criticized it as a uh, very, uh, what did he say, a very serious, uh, a very, uh, yeah, a very serious menace on the Taiwan, on the Taiwan Strait status quo. And it is true that depending on the way you interpret the referendum, from a Chinese consciousness point of view or Taiwanese consciousness point of view, you can you can view it uh, as a very different. You can have very different conclusions, and. Um, uh, for me, it's obvious that the uh, referendum in Taiwan was intended to not um, change the status quo because Taiwan has not that leverage, that, that kind of leverage uh, right now, but at least to, what I call in my writing, explore the status quo, which is an expression which is much more relevant, I think, to describe the current strategy of Taiwan in the, in the, in the Strait, to explore the status quo, to see little by little, to <coughs> each time try to, to progress a little, and if it's too much, then the Ameri American uh, uh, say something, then we come back, but not too much. And then next time, each time it's possible, we say, this is the same strategy from the Tanwe to Abia. It's the, exactly the same strategy, the same premise, the same technique, the same conclusion, the same reactions, it's exactly the same. Um, so in a way, Chirac or Bush were right to say that this referendum was a way to uh, change the status quo and that they condemned it. But concretely, when you look at the questions, none of the questions was uh, giving a, uh, an opportunity to the Taiwanese people to say we want independence or not. So if you see, technically speaking, it was not at all an attempt to change the status quo. So in fact, out in, 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 in in fact, w what kind of tool was it? I think that it was a way for the government, for ABN, it's a very personal, um, um, it's a very personal initiative, I think, designed by ABN. Uh, it's a way to say that, okay, since the world does not listen, does not recognize the, P the ROC, since our government does not have a seat in the United Nations, uh, since the world does not listen to our diplomats, then what can we do in order to show that we are not a part of China? Uh, we maybe we will reunify one day, but at least we <coughs> want to be consulted. We want to say what we want, uh, if we want to or if we don't want to. So what can we do? And I think the only solution was the referendum. Precisely, I say the only solution. Why? Why do I say that? Because with my students in in. <coughs> In Paris, I, I teach a class on Taiwanese geopolitics. Last year, much before, a few months before the idea of referendum was raised by ABN, we thought about this solution. At that time, it was about the uh, WHO, right? The World Health Organization. And I told to my student, imagine the impact, the international impact, if ABN organizes a referendum on the WHO asking the Taiwanese, do you want Taiwan to be part of the WHO or not? And the student told me the same thing as the KMT said this time, but what would you, would they ask this question? Because the, the, the answer is obvious, everyone would like to. Just as the KMT said, it's, it's a stupid question in the referendum because everyone, of course, fights the Chinese missiles. Well, everyone, not everyone, unfortunately, but 
And so, and, and by saying that, it shows that they don't understand the strategy which is behind. Of course, in Taiwan, everyone wishes that there is no missile targeted aimed at Taiwan, but it's not the aim. The aim is not either to tell China, get rid of your missiles, dismantle them. We don't want to, to, to be uh, under the threat of them. Everyone knows that China will never listen to Taiwanese people. But it's not the aim. It's not at all the aim. The strategy of Abin was different. The strategy was simply to have a figure, a percentage. A figure like 80% of the people say, no, we don't want to live under the threat of Chinese missiles, and you dismiss this figure afterwards in each of, uh, in each, each time he could in, uh, in <coughs> uh, I mean, uh, when defending Taiwan's position, Taiwan's diplomat would constantly use this figure showing that you don't recognize us, but look, Taiwan is a democracy, and then our democracy has produced this figure. A majority of our people do not want and we voted in a democratic procedure to say it. We don't want to be under the threat of China. And I suspect, I think that if Abien had uh, been uh, re-elected with a big margin, which had not uh, aroused so many debates, and if the uh, referendum had been passed, the following morning you would have found in the New York Times or in the Washington Post an article by Abien saying, okay, exactly what I said. You do not recognize us, okay, that's political realism, but look, a figure, our democracy produced this figure, then what do you do? And then now I turn to my question, what is the status quo in the Taiwan Strait? The thing is that there is no status quo anymore. There is no one China anymore. I mean, the one China policy is dead. And we don't recognize it yet. The one China policy in the Taiwan Strait is dead. The one China policy has functioned during 30 years when it was a, a, the best solution for the three sides, China, Taiwan, and the United States. And when, Taiwan, when, China, um, when the United States recognized the PRC in 1978, 1979, there was this sentence in the joint communique saying, Chinese on both sides recognize that there is only one China and that Taiwan is part of it. Okay. But then, then the government in Taiwan said Chinese. People in Taiwan are Chinese. <clears throat> but if government now in Taiwan denies it, and if over 60 or 70 percent in Taiwan now identify themselves first as Taiwanese and not anymore first as Chinese, then does this one China policy uh, still uh, uh, still um, um, it, does it correspond to 50 years of the same status quo? Uh, 30 years ago, Taiwan and China and, and, and America had the official full diplomatic relations. And then the diplomatic relations switched to China. So there is a big change. So obviously the status quo is not the same, right? And 20 years ago, the Taiwanese in Taiwan mostly identified with China. It's not the case anymore. So. Obviously, the status quo has changed a lot. And now that it has become more than theoretical, the interesting question is to, to ask is, is there any factor easy to forecast or mm, difficult to forecast that may suddenly break it? Suddenly. So there, there are different elements, different factors, different initiatives that can make the status quo evolve either step by step or brutally. One of them, one of them being the strategy followed by Taiwan since Lee Tang Wei, what I, t what I call to explore the status quo. Another one is China's strategy, because people who condemn uh, Taiwan's referendum, like Xi Haq or Bush, say it's threatening the status quo. But I'm sorry, what is threatening the status quo? Most immediately is China's missiles, not Taiwan's exploration the status quo. The main immediate threat are the missiles, it's obvious. So China itself is changing, is trying to change the status quo. In fact, everybody is trying to change the status quo except America. Why? Because diplomats are most comfortable with a status quo. That's, uh, again, a mere political logic. So Taiwan 
is trying to change the status quo, China is trying to, and both sides say, no, we don't. We respect the status quo. So, I mean, how long can it last? Obviously, it will change. And I think that it will change in the coming years, if not in the coming months. I don't know. Well, we'll see. Sure, it's yeah. another, another occasion to speak about that. But it might change. Just imagine if next month or in three months, one of the uh, democratic countries like Canada or France, no, France it's more probably, but another <laughs> country, uh, uh, votes uh, to support Taiwan's entry in the WHO. And the states will support it because it's a country. If one major country says that, if one, if one a parliamentary body of a major country says that, it's the beginning of the end. If one parliamentary body in the world passes a law saying Taiwan is a state, it's the beginning of the end. Ta China's situation is so untenable, it's so hard to, to sustain and to, it's so hard to claim, to, to prove that it's a legitimate proposition. It's so full of contradiction that one day it will, it will, it will break into pieces, it's, it's sure. And that is why China is using this missile threat because it's the only way for her the last way to implement and uh, to keep uh, this this hope of forcing Taiwan into negotiations. So, the um, um, unfortunately, the referendum did not pass. Be I say unfortunately because, after all, even though it was definitely politicized by both sides, um, it was the first experiment, the first time in Taiwan there was a direct democracy experiment, and such a bad start is. Uh, uh, of course, shows that it will be probably difficult to have another uh, trial in the near future, and it's unfortunate because if it had passed, if it had passed, um, we would have had this figure, a concrete figure showing that Taiwan's population does not want to live under fear, and it would have made things more simple. But um, one last detail, and I will finish with that: the referendum did not pass. That's right. But this is very related. If we use the French law, the French electoral law, at the same moment for the same question under the same political situation, the referendum would have passed. Because in Taiwan, in the electoral law, I'm sure you know about that, there is a condition is that it must, there must be more than 50, at least 50% of the uh, registered voters um, uh, who go to vote. And there was 55 in the first question and 56 in the second, or something like that. Uh, but in the French law, there is not such a requirement. Even though there is only 30% of the people voting, it's valid. Then you look at the result. Is it uh, yes or no? And uh, what is encouraging, too, is that most people who voted for the referendum said that in both on both questions, the number of people who said yes was more than the people who said no. So it's really unfortunate that everything is politicized in Taiwan. And why is it politicized? Just because the problem of Chinese consciousness and Taiwan consciousness, which blurs political perceptions in Taiwan, making so many people who should support democracy being very ambiguous now about Taiwan's democracy just because the democracy that they could not oppose at the beginning is little by little giving ways to Taiwan's people and politicians to reject the aim of unification. So pro-unification camps support for democracy is now very ambiguous. And that is the biggest threat to Taiwan, bigger than the Chinese missiles. Thank you.
when I was a student in, in uh, Paris Political Science Institute, I, I registered for a class on the mainland on PRC politics. And uh, the first time I, uh, the first class I could not make it, I was not present, and every student had chosen the, uh, the topics for the, uh, the course. And there is only one that nobody wanted. <laughs> So when I came the second time, the teacher told me, okay, are you interested in my list topic? And I said, I have no choice anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I chose it. And uh, the first book I read about Taiwan was not a very good book. It was about economy. But I had enough little details in that book to understand with intuition that there must be in Taiwan a strong national identity question. So I started to be interested immediately. And, uh, and uh, at twi when I was 20, I chose Taiwan to be my, my research topic. That was 12 years ago. Yeah. So you can deduct my age now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Oh, yeah, you, you, you raised your hand first, sorry. So am I correct in summarizing that what you're saying is that the mainlanders in China who were, or mainlanders in Taiwan, screwed up Taiwan as a whole chance to better their position in the world because they were afraid that that process would be later used to ruin their chances to ever unify or use their power uh, exactly. in Taiwan. That's exactly what I mean. I might be wrong, but I'm afraid it's the, it's the way it works. Yeah. Regarding the, um, the current elections, the past elections, like, how do you feel, like, what do you feel will be the future with the KMT party now that they've lost twice in a row? And how do you feel if they will, do you think they will try to control Congress as they did four years ago? And what okay. future of the DP? Okay. <coughs> you're, you're right to answer this question because now that the election is over, and hopefully, definitely over, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have the next big, big, big uh, electoral uh, um, meeting. The next issue is the uh, the uh, an election in the, the end of the year, which will which will be definitely absolutely important for Taiwan's future, because uh, for the most part of uh, of Chen's mandate, uh, he had no majority in the Lifayuan, the whole part, and so um, he was constantly unable to do what he wanted to do because of KMT's filibustering. The KMT has not been in opposition for 50, has had never been in opposition, and does not know how to play, um, what is the role uh, of being an opposition party. In political theory, a polit an opposition has a, a very precise role to play. When it's purely negative, destructive opposition, it does not help the country. And when it's a constructive opposition, then it helps perhaps the party in power, but also it helps its chances to to uh, to be back uh, to power. And that's that did not that did not happen during four years. The KMT has constantly prevented Chen uh, to act, which is a very uh, I feel I think they should be responsible if history for that because it's very detrimental to their own uh, people. It's, it's very serious to do that. So we'll see what happens in December. If Chen gets a majority, then there will be definitely a sustained pace of reform. If not, then the current situation will go on with incessant political debates and filibustering, and it will be terrible for Taiwan. But uh, I mean, that's what has been going on in Taiwan for, for a more than a decade already. and. It, quite, it suits Taiwan's international situation because anyway, Taiwan cannot progress very quickly in terms of international recognition and exploration of the status quo. So it must be step by step. And uh, well, of course, I hope the, the, that, that Chen will have its majority that helps him to implement reforms more quickly. But uh, I think they are all used to that situation. Okay. Now, uh, regarding the first part of your question, but you have in Taiwan younger people, slightly younger, or who appears younger, uh, in, uh, in the blue camp, like my or other people, who are definitely gaining uh, power. 
I think that maybe Song Chu, even Song Chu is finished, but Ma Yingqiu definitely not. Ma Yingqiu is probably the main threat to the, to the Greens in the future. Um, and uh, the KMT will definitely still have chances to, go to, to, to come back to power in the next 20 years. After 20 years, it's very unlikely. Because uh, because of this, not not of the book. <laughs> because of the Taiwanization of mainlanders, it's very unlikely that after 20 years the KMT will still have good chances to go to power. The problem is that uh, will China give Taiwan the time to wait 20 years for its identity movement to mature enough? to help everyone real, real, uh, realize that they belong to Taiwan, they are a part of this new community. I'm not sure. At the same time, it's a long debate because even though China would like not to give Taiwan the time, I'm not sure Taiwan, China has the power to act immediately. I even think the opposite. I don't think China has in any way the possibility to act before many years. And if China had to act, I think it should have been last week. <laughs> because of what was happening in Taiwan. We seriously considered the option. We seriously discussed the option. And since the premise what was China anyway has no military capability to attack Taiwan, uh, she will probably not attack. And that is why she's using this missile, this, this way to force Taiwan. It's not conventional forces, it's not nuclear forces, it's only ballistic missiles. It's the only way China can use to force Taiwan to negotiation. So, um, and she did not act. And then look at the coming political agenda. Uh, it's very unlikely that China may act in the coming years, which means that after 90, uh, 2009, 2008, 2009, 2010, it might become a serious period for Taiwan. But then, will the international situation be so in, fa in favor of China and, and not in favor of Taiwan? It's hard to focus. Because on the long run, it's obvious that more and more government, more and more parliamentary bodies, more and more uh, newspapers and media are aware of what's going on in Taiwan. And on the long run, everything in turn is turning in favor of Taiwan, not in favor of China. Even though the economies are linked closer and closer, on the long run, time is definitely against running against China. Definitely. Everyone is saying that China, time is running against Taiwan. I don't think so. That is why both sides are very nervous, especially China. And that is why the main strategy for Taiwan is to hold. Is that correct if I say that in English, to hold? Hold up. To hold firm, not to, uh, you studied French, right? No, there is something you studied French. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, to keep, the, um, to keep as long as possible. Because time is <coughs> on your side. So there are pressures, it's very hard. There are obstacles and challenges, but the longest, the longer you hold, the, the bigger are your chances. And, uh, and China is, of course, very nervous about that. On the short term, there is a constant dilemma, time dilemma, on Taiwan, because of the economy. On the long run, there is a constant time dilemma on China's side. So it's very hard to forecast the future, but I'm absolutely optimistic that China will not get Taiwan. And it, we, we still have maybe no, no more time. Sorry, everyone, we don't have time for questions. So uh, thank you, Stefan, for your wonderful time.